kind words from Earl, an old friend of mine. I met Earl first in 1964. I've been practicing Indian law for 57 years. And the first, the first 20 years of, the, of, the, of that time, I worked on the Blackfeet claims. And they were very difficult claims. And we succeeded. We won victories for the tribe. But we had the support of the tribe. And Earl, throughout that time, was a great leader and a, and a tremendous help. And, and there were many things that had to be worked out. And he, and he was able to do it. And one thing he did all that time was he would, every time I would come to, the, to Blackfeet, Earl would be my translator. And he was, the first time I came was in 1964. And Jim Whitecalf, still alive, 105 years old at that time. And he had been present at the negotiations of the treaty, the 1888 treaty, that had, uh, been, was the subject of the claim. Because we claimed and succeeded that the government had played, paid the tribe only a fraction of the true value of that claim. And another thing that was very notable one time, years later in the 1970s, I was, trans I was talking uh, about a, reporting on a claim, and in the middle of my, when I, whenever I would say something in English, Earl would translate it into Pagan. And this went on for quite a while. In the middle of my talk, somebody came in and told Earl he had an urgent message, so he left the room. And there he was standing. And about 15 minutes later, he came back and he started translating again. <laughs> and I don't know what he said exactly, because it was in Pangan. But I'll tell you one other story about Earl that I'll never forget. It was a great adventure. In the, sometime in the 1970s, I was on my way to the Fort Berthold Reservation in North Dakota. And I was going to, be, I was, I was going to take the Empire Builder uh, uh, east. But the, the train, uh, uh, Earl drove me to the station that morning, and the train had just left. They had changed the schedule without notifying anybody, and my train had gone. So we talked to the station manager, and he talked to the people in Cutbank, and they said, well, they'd hold the train for 10 minutes. And uh, Earl said, come on, let's go. We got, I got into his, he had a big red truck, and he never went under 100 miles an hour that whole trip. <laughs> Let me tell you, I was, it was very exciting. <laughs> and then we got to Cutbank, and I got on the train. I was so relieved, and the train pulled out. And about two minutes later, the train stopped and pulled back. Some other passenger on the train had gone out for a smoke, and the train left without him. <laughs> but that was notable. But Earl was somebody that I feel very fortunate to have known and to have my friends in the Blackfeet Nation all those years ago. And I, uh, I feel very honored to have worked for you, and I'm glad that I was able to help. Thank you, Jerry. You know, I used to bring those elders back with me. They didn't speak English, they didn't understand English. Some might have few words, but whenever you, they used an English word, they used a cuss word. <laughs> <laughs> but those elders, I used to bring them here in Washington, D.C. We used to go before the Claims Commission going before the congressional people. Jerry was with us. And I, those elders would speak, and I would interpret for them. They made it very strong for our case. And those elders that were gone, but they left something for the people to enjoy. Thank you, Jerry, for being with us. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for for joining us here today with the Blackfeet, Blackfoot uh, storytelling uh, this afternoon here. Uh, my name is James McNeely and I'm a member of the Blackfeet tribe in Browning and I will be serving someone as a moderator along with our respected elders and members of the Blackfoot Confederacy here today. Uh, we have with us today uh, our CEO of the Black, Blackfoot Confederacy. Hello. Blackfoot Confederacy, Mr. Jack Royal, uh, my wife, uh, Natya Tapiaki, my son, Natoansky, uh, our Blackfoot Immersion teacher, uh, Mr. Robert Hall, 
Chief Earl Old Person, uh, John Murray from the Blackfeet Tribe, Mr. Jim Swag from the Gunny Nation, and Mr. and Mrs. Martin and Pam Heavyhead from the Blood Tribe. They'll be doing some dialogue here talking about Blackfoot history, culture, language, where we are today, where we're going, how the language is being taught again, how we've united again as a confederacy. <coughs> so we'll just kind of have some discussion here. And just for, uh, uh, so Jerry knows, it's Jerry, right? Yes. Uh, Earl still drives that fast. <laughs> so uh, we want to just make sure that we acknowledge uh, Earl has been our hereditary chief for uh, the last 40 years, but he's been our tribal chairman for 50 plus years and a councilman for 60 plus years. And he still gets all over and he still comes to Washington. You see, this is, he's in his, uh, in right where he needs to be right now. And all of the folks you see here are ceremonial people or people of the Blackfoot Confederacy. So I guess uh, we'll uh, turn it over to, uh, to Earl to kind of get us started. He's a good orator and can get us going on, on this here today. Well, I'm glad <clears throat> that we could have our Blackfoot Confederacy. You know, our people, they still use their way of life in trying to relay that to their uh, young people, to the upcoming generation. You know, there was a time back in the late 50s, uh, or late 40s, we didn't have people that could really relate to our young people. In fact, we didn't have the dancers that you saw out there, young people to dance. But it came very strong, in the late 50s, 60s, our young people wanting to be part of our way of life. They wanted to learn more about the life that we lived, the life that we come from. And we saw we had people that were ready to help those young people. Today, they are here. The people are here to help the young people, such as this little boy. He speaks a, a prayer in, his, in our language. These are the kinds of things that we're relaying to our people that want to learn. Today, it's, uh, we're, we're living a very trying times, but we are still finding a way to cope with those things that constantly uh, confront us. And being, and we, although that we're here enjoying ourselves, but yet a lot of our people, there's things that they want for their people. And we tried to find those people in those uh, places where we could bring back something to our people or to find a ways for our people. This Washington, D.C. Is, is a central office. That's where we come to. The Blackfeet people or the, the people, Indian countries throughout the United States, this is where we come to try to find something that our people are wanting. But we're not, this, we're not the people that are just wanting all the time. We like to give ourselves. We like to give something, just as you witnessed here, or our powers. Whenever we can help to give something, we're willing to do it. We have a lot of things that help that backs us up, our prayers, our songs, our dances. But still, today our young people are learning the, day that the, the things that's going to take them through in the future. Our elders, my father for one, he didn't dwell on the bad things, but he used it as, uh, as a challenge. To me, as a child, he encouraged me. He said, do the best that you can. In Indian language, he didn't speak English. Do the best that you can to learn some kind of a higher learning. He said, that's going to be the future of your life. Education, he was talking about. A lot of our elders done that to their children. My father used himself as an example not speaking English, not understanding it. He says, I'm a man that's blind, that's deaf. I can't hear and I can't understand. I can't be able to read or do the, speak the language of the white man world. He says, but I want you to find something else that's going to carry you through. 
That was the encouragement that my father gave me. And so today, our people here are trying to give you something that you may know us by, something that you may use to help yourselves. Our people on the Indian nations, Canada, United States, they accommodate people. You come to our Blackfeet nation, you can still go to some people that probably are in need of help, but they're not going to dwell on that. When you come and meet those people, they're going to extend their hand for a handshake. If they have a cup of water, they're going to offer it to you. They're not going to say, I want something, but deep inside they're hurting. That's what makes us strong people. That's what keeps us going because we're strong in our prayers and our ways. So with that, that's a kind of an opening, and we'll give it back to Jim. Thank you, Earl. I, uh, I think we'll start out with, uh, at the end there, with uh, the heavy heads. They were going to give us a little bit of uh, history on the, on the culture and the ceremonial life of the black people. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> um, so um, I was wondering what I should talk about in terms of uh, culture and ceremony. But um, the, um, the training for, for somebody to become an elder or to become a ceremonialist actually starts at a, at a very early age. If a person can speak the language, then uh, that person will, will, will hear the stories, will hear the creation stories uh, as, it's pass as these stories are passed down from our grandfathers. And it's uh, usually our grandparents that tell us these stories because our parents will be out working, and so we spend a lot of time with our, with our grandparents. In my case, it was uh, my grandmother who would sit us around her and she would tell us stories about creation, stories about all of this kind of stuff. <clears throat> how the buffalo came to be, how the teepees were made, uh, how uh, travel, uh, travel was done from one camp to the next with dogs and then later on with horses. And these, these stories are very old. And, uh, uh, and, and of course, they're referred to as creation stories. So these creation stories um, <clears throat> talk about things like, uh, there's a story about Katuyis, or the uh, uh, sweet pine. And uh, what, uh, what uh, the, the story goes that Katuyis uh, came to be uh, very miraculously. It was, uh, it was an old couple that uh, they had a son-in-law and the son-in-law was taking all the daughters. And um, so, so one day they went out hunting and by going hunting they meant they went to the mountains. There was a cave where there was buffalo and they chased the buffalo out into a buffalo jump and uh, they would kill the buffalo and, and uh, <clears throat> take the meat. The uh, son-in-law would never give any meat to his, uh, his father-in-law. And um, so he'd never give any meat to his father-in-law. But one day he found a blood clot on the ground, so he hid it in his breech cloth. Took it home to the old lady and uh, gave it to her and told her, I found something, boil it and we'll have something to eat. So while the, while the blood clot was boiling, um, they heard a baby crying. They went running to the, to the boiling water and, and there was a baby in there. They pulled the baby out. So they put, <coughs> the baby of course was, uh, was a uh, very uh, miraculous baby. And so uh, <coughs> he, said, he said to the old couple, hold me up against each of the teepee poles and pray. So she did that. 
And then at the end, he jumped off TP Pone. He was a grown young man. And so we asked, what's going on? And um, so what's happening? And uh, so they told him the story of uh, their son-in-law and how he was taking all their, their daughters and that. So he went to, he went to kill the, uh, the son-in-law or the, his brother-in-law, and he let all his uh, sisters free. And then he went to back to the mountain where the cave was. He opened the cave and let out all the buffalo. And so from that story, that's why there's buffalo across the plains. Um, this, is a, this is a creation story from a long time ago. And uh, that's where uh, the first mention of a buffalo jump is. And uh, <clears throat> if you look at Blackfoot territory, the north, uh, the north Saskatchewan to the north, the Yellowstone River to the south, the um, the uh, Rocky Mountains to the west, and and out into the prairie around uh, the Saskatchewan Man Manitoba border was Blackfoot territory, and uh, without within that territory, especially on the um, eastern slopes of the Rockies are thousands and thousands of buffalo jumps. And it was the Blackfoot that, that put all these buffalo jumps there. And that's how we, uh, we survived. And throughout the territory, in, uh, in coolies and rivers, um, there's all these buffalo jumps. We also have teepee rings where we mark our camps. And all these teepee rings are right throughout uh, Blackfoot territory as well. And also uh, medicine wheels or cairns, where there were big, uh, big circles of stone on the ground, and uh, in the center would be a pile uh, of uh, of rocks as a cairn to mark different spots within our territory. And of course, every river, every creek, every hill has a name. So learning these stories about creation and about how we came to be where we were, where we are today, um, we, we start, as we get older, we start to take part in different societies. And uh, there's younger societies, and then you go from a, young, one, a younger society to an older society to an older society in terms of age. And uh, as you go along, you learn the songs, you learn the ceremonies within each of the, uh, within each of the uh, societies. And as you get transferred these rattles or bundles or, or pipes or what have you, uh, you learn the songs, you get the right to learn the songs. And uh, all of these songs relate to the stories, the creation stories. So when you do a ceremony, it's describing uh, uh, <coughs> a creation story that we have within all of these stories. There's, there's hundreds, of, hundreds and hundreds of stories. And each of those ceremonies go back to those, uh, refer back to those, uh, to those stories. So we have, uh, <clears throat> so we have, um, uh, so as, uh, as long as a person knows the language, can learn the stories, and then you build on that, on those stories, into the ceremonies and in, into the, uh, into each of the societies. So a person has to get transferred into a society before they can learn those songs of each of the societies and learn the stories of each of the societies. And each society does have a story, and uh, it's, it's told by the people of, within that society. Now, once, you, um, once a person has been uh, transferred into a society, they will transfer out. In some cases, a person will become uh, a grandfather right away and start teaching. Uh, in the case of other societies, you have to wait a few generations of that society before it can start working as, uh, as an elder. So I'll stop there and I'll let my wife say a few words. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Pam Heavyhead. I've been married to Martin for 45 years, and um, we um, we have um, five children. We have one son and four daughters. We have seven grandchildren um, that are biological grandchildren. We also have grandchildren here that are um, <clears throat> Jim, Marie, and Kaysen because, you know, in ceremony, that's how we become related is we give what we know and help raise our children and our grandchildren in those ceremonies. One of our elders, uh, the late Frank Weaselhead, had told us, you know, we're in the middle of five generations. We are with our parents and our grandparents. Even if we're not with them, we're with people of their age group and ourselves, our children, and our grandchildren. And that's how we move forward. Our knowledge, our skills, um, our history, our stories are so, become so important. That's what gives us our sense of belonging. One of our other elders, uh, Adam Delaney, had told us, in the future, who's going to stand up and say, I'm from the blood tribe, and what does that look like? Do you have a name? Who, is your, who are your people? Who are your family? What is your landscape? What is your food? Uh, what are your traditions? All of those things I thought I took for granted in my parents' house because my parents told us those things. Um, and as we get older and we have children, what are we giving them? What is it that uh, we, when we say that we hold our children's lives as sacred, what does that mean? What, what are we giving them? What is that honor that they should know about who they are? And my dad always used to say, you can't know where you came from, or you can't know where you're going unless you know where you came from. So knowing our people, knowing our stories, knowing our, the stories of the stars, we believe we are star people. You know, it's, it's so important because it is our generation that is the first generation of parents and grandparents that didn't have to surrender our children to residential school or child welfare. It is, it is us that have the privilege and the honor of we speak our language and for our grandchildren to hear that and to hear them pray, like what, what Kaysen did for us the other evening, um, that's so exciting and to be celebrated. And it's their birthright, as much as it was our birthright, to know those things. I used to think, oh, I used to get so mad at my mom because, you know, we'd be at the Sundance, we'd be at the ceremony, and. I'd want to play with those kids that are playing outside because they have popsicles and bicycles and riding horses. And my mom would tell me, turn around and listen to them. They're praying and pray for that one and that one and that one. And, and I used to just roll my eyes and just think, oh my God, you know, w when does this end? But that was such a treasure and such a blessing. So when we got married, it was only natural that you know, when our parents ch chased us to our elders, that we had a place to go. When we had a sick child, um, our, my mom and dad said, well, go to the elders. Well, what does that mean anyways? <laughs> you know, so we went to the elders, and they sent us to other elders and to other elders, so we had a whole group of people helping us, teaching us to know what to do how to help our daughter so that she could help herself. And along with that, 
they, they asked us right away, does she have a name? No, she doesn't have a name. Well, then get her a name. Go to the first thunder sweat and your husband will, will go on your behalf. So there was all this stuff along the way that we had to learn. And now when I think about it, you know, um, those were all things of such value that helped us become stronger people and be able to um, lead our own ceremonies and, and still live in a Western world where we have to have work, jobs, university, and all of that stuff. But it's the way that we live and how we live at home, uh, how we smudge, having our own stuff, getting our own uh, sweet grass, getting our own sweet pine, getting our own sage, getting our own um, uh, pemmican, and having to be able to do those things for ceremony. Like, it's a lifelong thing, and it, it's not... Uh, it's not something that we go and get at university or at, at college or at our paying jobs, but it's a way of life that we live with our people and hopefully in the future that will close this gap of disconnect uh, of our children and grandchildren and that will arrive at a place where um, children will have complete understanding and sense of belonging of who they are as First Nations people with our help and our support. You know, we don't have um, a lot of people um, that have that knowledge. And for those of us that do, you know, we have to work twice as hard to catch up so that our kids will be independent and strong people and that in the future that they'll carry forward um, their ways and um, that they'll have a healthier history and that they will be very strong in who they are as First Nations people. Again. Thank you, uh, Martin and Pam, for that. I think we'll uh, go over to uh, uh, Jack Royal, our CEO of the Blackfoot Confederacy, to uh, enlighten us on, on what the Blackfoot Confederacy is and how it's functioned in the past, present, and in the future of, of that role. So, Jack? Okay. Good morning. Um, good afternoon. Glad to see you all here. Um, there's so many things we can talk about. Um, I first would like to acknowledge the people who I'm sitting with, um, very distinguished people, um, and I'm honored to sit at the stage with them, so I'd like to acknowledge all of them. They, they're all... Um, very distinguished and honored people in, in, our, in our Blackfoot way. Um, there was a few things I wanted to talk about. There's, there's so many things, as I mentioned, that we can speak about. Um, our history, our future, who we are, where we're going, what we're doing, etc. cetera. Um, I know I only want to take a few minutes. I know we don't have much time. So I thought, well, let, let me tell a story or something. Let me, let, me, let me just enlighten some of you. So I guess for us as Blackfoot people, historically, our territory was, as you heard, in Montana, uh, into Wyoming, Idaho, um, and into the Canadian border, which is where I'm from. I'm from Siksika. There's four tribes, Ghana, Siksika, Bikani, Amskapi, Bikani that comprise the Blackfoot Confederacy as Blackfoot people. We all speak the same language. We all have the same societies, the same traditions, the same culture, the same cultural, uh, uh, spiritual beliefs, and same ceremonies and songs. So we're all connected. 
we've been here since time immemorial, and we've, we're attached to the land, and we're governed by, for lack of a better term, Blackfoot law, which is essentially uh, natural law, our way of life. It's very multidimensional. It's very uh, um, spiritual. Uh, as such, we're, we're very environmental, land steward, and we're, there's a connection. Everything has a life. Everything has a purpose. Everything has a reason. Things don't just happen. There's a reason why we're here today, all of us. And so as such, this, these are the practices that we, we follow. And so we don't just go and act any old way. We don't just go do any old thing. You know, there's a reason for everything. So it's very intricate. It's very, um, our, our system of how we conduct ourselves is very um, systematic. There's a lot of protocol. You don't just go do something. You don't just go act a certain way or do a certain thing. Everything has a reason. So I'm, I don't have the rights to, to get into the details of how we do that in our societies. The people that I'm sitting with do, and they can speak to it if they choose. However, we're, we're taught these things as we grow up. So without getting into too much detail, I wanted to mention that Prior to European contact, we had this very intricate society, uh, this er very intricate system, these beliefs that were based on our own ways, uh, ways, Blackfoot ways. And when Europeans arrived, you know, they automatically assumed that we were nomadic, running around, chasing buffalo, just doing anything which was partly true, but again, there was a reason for everything. We were nomadic to a territory, and everything that we did was based on uh, the Creator, our way of life, Mother Earth, Father, Son. Today when we pray, we still say that. Uh, uh, we mention it in our prayers every day. And someone mentioned uh, First Thunder, is a good example. We don't celebrate the new year and count down and then happy new year. It's first thunder is essentially our new year. So that could happen anytime, you know, in the spring. And once that happens, it kicks off a sequence of events in our culture, in our history, to where we have to be in, at that time, to what we're doing and the ceremony and the songs that come with it. So it's nomadic to a territory, and our territory was Idaho, Montana, Alberta, Saskatchewan, both sides of the border. So I wanted to just to maybe enlighten you a little bit of who we are, where we come from, and that these systems were in place long before European contact, 500 years ago or so. And when European contact came, they assumed that we were just a bunch of Indians running around, um, and that we didn't have systems in place. I think now we're going through some renaissance where people are now starting to realize that, hey, wait a minute, there was things that were happening. There's another realm. There's these different connections that we have. Maybe we should listen to these Indians. Maybe they know what they're talking about. And this is what, we're, you know, what you're gonna hear or what you've heard, is that there is. And this was how we were all raised, all of us. And we all know that. And so it's now becoming more enlightening. And people are, are thinking, and you, and you read books about it, and, and you hear about it. And that's why you're all here. And so I don't want to get into too much detail with that. I don't have the right to do that. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. That with, these systems that were intact thousands of years ago are still intact now, and, and there's proof up here. Um, where, that's where we've been. Where we're going in the future is we're starting to strengthen those, strengthen those uh, systems, for lack of a better term. In, in, in our language, we don't have a word for systems. Uh, 
It's, it's totally different on how we speak. And so where we're going in the future is to continue to strengthen what we're, where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. And hopefully, you know, we'll be able to share that with people that are willing to listen because there is other things out there rather than what you see, what you hear, who, what, when, where, why, the five senses or whatever. There's other things out there. And I'm not trying to sound mystical or, or, uh, or scary or anything. However, there is other things. And you all know. You all feel it. We all know. And so you just have to believe and have faith. And that's where we come from. So I don't want to take too much time. I will stop there and turn it back over to Jim. Thank you, Jack. <clears throat> Uh, you know, Jack hit on uh, talking about land and our territory. I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, one of our traditional, um, our tribal historical preservation officer who's done extensive work, who's been part of many societies, but done extensive work with something you've probably heard of called the Badger Two Medicine, and that's part of, part of the reason we've been out here this past week um, and still continuing the fight for our traditional lands. So I'm going to ask John Murray if he'll uh, speak a little bit about traditional land use and, and what we're continuing to do to protect our sacred areas. Good afternoon. <coughs> I had a whole different story in my head, so I guess we'll go in a different direction here. Uh, <coughs> and welcome, uh, Jerry Strauss. Uh, I, I tried pretty hard to get you guys together, but calling around, and cause Earl's talked very highly of you down through the years. I served with Earl on the tribal council uh, over 30, maybe almost 40 years ago, 30, 37 years ago. Uh, I, I uh, you know, I've, I've uh, the elders asked me to study uh, Western philosophy, and it, and uh, I'm going to tell you, and I'll try to tie it together later in the story. But I, I have a couple associate degrees and uh, one in bilingual education. And I have a bachelor's degree in uh, Western philosophy. I have a master's in, uh, in uh, community education. Then I, I studied the doctorate. I completed a coursework and passed the comprehensive exams. And, uh, and I didn't do the last two dissertate two uh, chapters. I wanted to be known as one of the people instead of having a degree that would paint me in a corner in my community. But I I uh, I wanted to say that, uh, uh, and I'll try to tie this back. Uh, this is all ad lib, right? It, it, uh, so, the, uh, the Glacier Park and the Badger Two Medicine were lands west of of our Indian Blackfeet Reservation, uh, and the north portion of it became the Glacier National Park in 1910. And the land was we lost the land in 1895. The southern portion of that is called the Badger Two Medicine. And so right now on January 21st, there's a case uh, being heard here in DC in the US Court of uh, uh, Appeals. And but we only one lease left there. In 1982, they were, they were uh, 48 leases granted in that. And down through the years, people have relinquished the leases uh, some by tax credits, others by uh, uh, some people visiting the land and, and saying it's, it's just the right thing to do. Uh, others we've negotiated with and uh, come to uh, different types of agreements. There's only one lease left. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to code switch here a little bit. Uh, I. Uh, I joined the high societies uh, in 1985, and uh, four months ago, I became an elder. 
and that's a good 30, 34 years. So I'm going to tell you a story. <clears throat> this lady uh, called on, on called my house. And we had just come from Six God, uh, one of the high ceremonies, and there was some uh, pemmican that was made. And uh, <clears throat> and the lady said, uh, my grandson Greg Morse was in a car accident and and his brain is bleeding and they can they, they can put him in a helicopter and send him over to Great Falls <clears throat> to cut a piece of his skull out or drill holes in it to relieve the pressure. Is there anything you could do to help him? So well we'll we'll do our best. So one of the ceremonies that passed down uh, I went and did the ceremony. And then there was Saturday morning, about 6 o'clock, and we had to go to Great Falls that day, my wife and I. And she said, uh, we got down there about 10, and she said, are you going to go over to the hospital? I said, no, he, he's going to be all right. And at noon, the, Greg Morris got on to Facebook, and he was getting discharged from the hospital. When you tell those kind of stories, you know, these gentlemen here, and tell them stories from now till Monday, maybe, you know, maybe. So, you know, people tell me, where did you get your education? You know, I'd say Montana State University, but I didn't finish the last two chapters of my doctoral dissertation. When I could have said, my education come from the land. We're inextricably connected to the land. North, the north portion of, of the west, the land we lost in 1895, Glacier National Park. There are sites in Glacier National Park that were used for millennia that are unresponsive ceremonially to to the high ceremonies. Just to add a little bit to that, working with the University of Arizona for doing research for going on 17 years now, and, and we are indigenous to the area. And there was, there was a point found last summer. It was down in a glacial till like 14,000 years. And we're maybe on a cusp or pretty soon, soon going to make the scientific assertion that those are Blackfeet. University of Alberta has proven on the, on the mountain uh, around St. Mary's Lakes, uh, uh, points taken off there and, and artifacts taken off there date beyond 10,000 years are Blackfeet. We have been a part of that land for a long time. And so the Badger II medicine is, is relatively undisturbed. And, and we need that land. We need it to, to remain that way. We've been fighting this fight for a long time. Earl started uh, way back when it starts, I think, Arizona v. California, when, and the leases came out in, in the Badger II medicine by Secretary Watt. And, and so we have been, people say, where did you get your education? Where did that knowledge come from? It came from the land, from the mountains. And the land, and, and it is, it is a, an epistemological source of knowledge for us. How can, you know, how, it, you know, it's a totally different knowledge system. These gentlemen to my left uh, are uh, elders, and they they know that we have a knowledge system. It's not secret, but it's privy. And and if you can cross, if you 
transcend that role of a skeptic, you can use it. I, and one more story before I close. A friend of mine who's been, and I can tell these stories because they're mine. A friend of mine who was involved in a Badger II medicine trying to help us protect it for a long, long time. Uh, <clears throat> he's a non-Indian. Come from Pennsylvania, and his, his ancestors come from Scotland. <clears throat> and so, in November of 17, 2017, people called me and said, your friend Michael's uh, in a hospital over in Bozeman. He went down there for a meeting and he me had to hospitalize him. And uh, <clears throat> so, was, and then pretty soon, he texted me. He said, I'm very sick. He said, uh, I have melanoma and diagnosed with melanoma and it's got into my lymph nodes. Can you help me? I have a thunder medicine pipe. I sat down and I was praying and it was hanging above my head. So I got to thinking, really, you know, how can I help my friend? And it dawned on me. It was right there. So in June of 2018, he came to a ceremony at the, uh, what we call uh, after the first thunder, we announced we opened the the thunder medicine pipe, and he at that uh, he danced with the pipe and announced that he was cancer free. That that land of the Badger Two Medicine is that important to us, and for mankind even. Okay, Thank you, John. Now we're going to switch roles over to uh, one of our respected elders from the North Pagan tribe, uh, Mr. Jim Swag, on his role as, as an elder to our Blackfoot people and differentiating the difference between elder and an older person. Okay. Tukhana <laughs> Me Good afternoon. My name is uh, Jim Swag. I'm from the uh, North Pagan, from uh, Canada, Alberta. The border separates uh, the, the Northern Pagan and the South Pagan. So I want to tell I'm really honored to be asked to be to participate in. in in today's uh, in the Black Blackfeet uh, festival, I'll share a little bit of our history about Ichinnistimukpi Akakstim, Oki Ninawaki. When we uh, signed our treaty in 1877, we signed our treaty in, uh, at the uh, Blackfoot Crossing, the Pikani. Sixika, Kaena. Sakse, the Stonies and the, and the Sarsi were allies. They were camp, camped away from us. And because of the type of people, the Blackfoot people were, we didn't leave anybody out. So we invited them to sign, to, to sign uh, the, the treaty in 1877. It was about 205 p.m. when was signed, no. So as time went on, so we were, we worked, we were wards of the government. As time went on, um, we, uh, we, we received rations from the government. They gave us bad rations, yellow, yellow flour. They gave us blankets that had uh, 
disease in them. A lot of our people died of smallpox. I think uh, in the early 1900s, there were only 300 Pikani members. At the time, the, the elders, the, the chiefs, men talked about transferring some of our members to, to the blood reserve. And our members said, no, we'll stay, we'll stay back and, and, and remain in Canada, I mean, in Pikani. So from there, we talk about residential school. The priests came in, the nuns, the government, wanted to uh, take the Indian out of, out of us and, and become white people. Well, we stayed at the residential school. Um, a lot of us didn't, didn't speak uh, the English very well because the, the uh, nuns and the priests spoke Latin. So I had really broken English. That's why I have broken English right now. So anyways, there was a lot of uh, uh, abuse. The, the children were abused. 1965, I think our school closed, our residential school. But prior to that, we weren't able to vote in the federal election until in the early 1960s. I believe it was 62. And then in 1966, we were able to drink in a bar, in an elk, you know, drink alcohol in the bar. The alcohol opened. And there was chaos for a few years. So then we had the two year system of council that we had a long time, long time chief that, that, that ran. We had 12 counselors and, 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 and one chief. So when we were doing our ceremonies back in those days, we had to do it secretly. It was kind of an underground because we didn't want the police, anybody to know what we were doing. We didn't involve our children, uh, anybody. My dad used to talk about when, when he was young, he went to a ceremony they'd send him away because they didn't want to be interrupted. They didn't want him to know the ceremonies because of, because of, the, uh, because of the, the uh, police. They could be charged or, or, or taken to jail. A lot of our ceremonial items were given to the museum. Some were burnt by, by the priests. So as time went on in the 70s, there was a group of, group of young men. There was late Alan Pard, Leonard Bastien, I believe it was William Big Bull, was, was one, of, one of the few that said, okay, we're gonna start, we're gonna revive our culture. We're gonna revive some of our traditional ways. So they started out with the powwow. None of our people, we had, a, we had a lot of people that used to dance, what, what you've seen earlier, the traditional dancers, chicken dancers. So they started the, uh, those three individuals in 1972, they started the uh, powwows over again, over again. So then we started having drum groups and whatnot. And there was a few elders that, that were, that, that, that had uh, ceremonial bundle, the medicine pipe. So they started, Alan, Alan and Jerry started to push the, uh, tried to start to learn the songs and went to the different museums to bring back the, uh, the medicine pipe, the beaver bundle, Kanatsumi tax and, 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 and whatnot. So now today, we're, we're, we're rich in, in, in our culture. We have medicine pipe bundles, we have beaver bundles, especially in Browning, the Horn Society. Uh, we have Sixika as a group, uh, Kana as a group, and so is the, the Blackfeet. So now our children are being involved. We have, we have uh, young people that, that participate. 
like uh, Natoansky. He participates in, in, in you know in the ceremonies. He's he's uh, top notch. He's one of the individuals with with the top notch. So our young people are, are learning the language through prayer. And with, with today, it, 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 it really helps our, our, our people to, to, uh, to, to get them to understand our ways. Ken. Thank you, Jim. And uh, Jim hit on a very important subject that we'll roll right into. Our last subject for today is language preservation and immersion and sitting to my immediate left is uh, Mr. Robert Hall, who has taken it upon himself to teach our young people uh, the Blackfoot language. And fortunately for us, all of the folks sitting up here are fluent speakers of our language. And of a group of about 44,000, we're probably down to around 3,000 that still speak our language. So with the immersion programs and the teachers like Robert and utilizing the elders and the speakers you see here will preserve the language. So Robert. Okay, this is no gums copy be cane. It's inch cars and one of guy cuts. I am only inch cars of a gay person. Usually I say puno gay sukas. My name's uh, Elk Shirt. Okay, uh, I'm from, from a gay person, the old ancient language you'd say uno gay cuts, from what I was told. But uh, to most speakers, I just tell my name is Puno Kesukasim, so they hear those words. Um, <clears throat> I grew up on the reservation, and uh, you know, I die of the wamiksi, I eat tea, puiks, I want to Any any neat tea, puiks, any do the map. I would always hear all the speakers constantly talk about how important our language is, and um, I would always think, well. So I want to speak that language. So that's about what So I went around asking questions. How do you ask? And I find myself very lucky because it's the ones who came before me that set up the, uh, the path. The people in the 70s, they already reclaimed their identity started great, great growing their hair and revitalizing the ceremonies. And they raised their children, telling them to listen to those old people. And I was fortunate enough to be born in that era where there was a lot of reclamation that I didn't have to do because the people who came before me had already done it. But um, it's tough. Because you don't hear the language spoken much. You know, this man here is my chief. And I'm really fortunate that every time I go to Itakhtop, he's there. You know, every time I go to our casino, he's there. And uh, I see him and I go talk to him and we share jokes. Um, but the thing that our, story, our language is dependent on is our stories, because it's stories that bring us together and we talk to each other and we find out and we laugh, we cry, we mourn, and we love each other through the stories we tell each other. So I'm going to tell you guys a quick story in Blackfoot. Uh, so, uh, um, I'm not that good at telling jokes because I was the end and no one laughed. 
I'll translate it. So long ago, there was a bikani. He was walking around, and he, was, he thought to himself, I'm hungry. Yeah. And then he went down to the river, and he started fishing, and he saw this man drinking water from that creek. And he says to that man, hey, don't drink that water. Cow's pooping there. <laughs> and that man yells at him. He says, I'm a white man. I don't understand your Indian language. I don't know what you're saying. Speak English to me, you turkey. So that Pikani, he was offended, but he smiled. And then in English, he says to him, oh, go ahead, drink that water. It's real good. <laughs> but the thing about teaching our language is that we are we're, we're met with something very tough. Uh, when we first arrived in the D.C., we had the uh, wonderful opportunity of having a night tour through the Capitol Hill, that Capitol building, and we went out to the speaker's, uh, speaker's podium. We got to see it down. And I looked down, I saw the Native American Museum, and it hit me. I'm all like, well, they're still looking down at us after all these years. But more importantly, too, as I walked through those halls, um, I reminded myself that the people who have went through this building have decided to... Uh, allocate billions of dollars to eradicate my language, to put me in the situation I am now. So basically what I'm saying is uh, we up here are living testaments to that billion dollars of failure. <laughs> but they still succeeded in a way because and you don't hear our language much spoken anymore. But because of our decisions, we will bring it back. And now, you know, the funding that they give to us is pennies and nickels compared to the billions of dollars they spent to get rid of it. Because that tells you who, what they valued. And it's unfortunate that those that value our language are the ones that could only get us pennies and nickels. And I don't mean that as a criticism as much as it, it's amazing that when they wanted to take from us, the money was there. But now that they want to support us, that we need to fight for that money. But we're still here, but more importantly, we're always going to be here. Our destination, our, our, our journeys in life are tied to one another. We ourselves, we're a binational people. We're in Canada and the United States. My life and my job is dependent on crossing that border because the people up north, they have words that I forgot. Matter of fact, one time, uh, I heard, I heard a few words for the word bat. One word I heard was, um, um, and I actually traveled 300 miles to learn that one word. <laughs> That's unfortunate. You know, in the English language, just by speaking the English language, we create an economy for that language. With my language, Right. The, the United States government and the Canadian government did a darn good job in making it economically dead. But as you hear today, the last thing I'll say is these elders and the people who spoke before me spoke about how important our ceremonies are. Our language is spiritually alive. More spiritually alive than the English language to this day. So although they were able to destroy and take a lot of words from us, they weren't able to take our breath away. And um, it's very important. Again, we're always going to be here. Our destinations is entwined. So it's always good to learn about us. Because we're, we're really kind and gentle people. We enjoy teaching. People, Blackfeet, we were always happy when people wrote books about us. Like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm writing this book. What does that mean? Oh, people around the world will know about you. Oh, okay. Write it down. <laughs> but um, thank you all. And one last thing I'm going to do is I want to teach you guys something. Right here, everybody do this. That just means good. Suka means good. Okay, again. Thank you, Robert, uh, for that. Uh, so to close, just, uh, you know, we're all on it. Now we're into time, how they're timing us, and they just put up that little sign, five minutes. And so I'm going to ask Earl to close out uh, today's event here, and uh, only fitting that he would do that. So, Chief? I guess, uh, you know, I was talking about those elders that I used to interpret for, and they didn't speak English.
but they all had PhD. We're post hole diggers. <laughs> <laughs> but they lost that PhD because they invented something to dig post holes. <laughs> so they lost their post hole digger. One thing that the uh, elders that I used to be with, I started interpreting for them in 1953. There were three groups of them. The very elders that uh, uh, Jerry Strauss remembers that I interpret for. Then there was a second group and a third group. 1980s is when we ran out of those people that needed interpretation. One of the things that those elders told me, and I heard them talk about, they said, they talked about the lands that we lost, Sweetgrass Hills to Glacier Park. One of the things that they had told me, he says, although we lost our buffaloes in those areas, we lost the land or whatever, all the things that we used. He says, but in the future, the white man's still going to hunt buffaloes on those lands. And I often, and they're still going to get, receive wealth from them. And I often wondered, what were they talking about? I visit those, uh, three, those uh, three grass hills all the time. There is one butte, the middle butte I go to. One time I was parking there, and I was looking. I start seeing all the oil wells, farmers all, all the way up to those street grass, those hills. And it just dawned on me at that time. And I said, this is what those elders were talking about. They're going to still hunt buffaloes. They're going to still receive their wealth from that area. Today, they're using that. We lost it for, with a very few dollars. Glacier National Park. This is what we're afraid of. That will happen to Badger to Medicine if we give in. That is why we're standing fast. We're doing the best we can to preserve it, to keep it. Today, you see these individuals here were four tribes, three in Canada and us Blackfeet. We were interrelated. We are interrelated. We speak the same language. We're seeking for the same kinds of things. And we do the same kinds of ceremonies. And this is what keeps us strong. Just very recent years, the Blackfoot Confederacy, they regrouped and they become very strong. And they are strong today. And they're going to continue pursuing those that they think that will best help we as the Blackfoot Confederacy. Thank you. I, I know we're well over time, but before we, uh, before we leave, I, I forgot I have a gentleman out in the audience here. It would be only fitting to ask him to come say a few words, uh, not only with our language and fighting for the land and the Badger II medicine and, and culture and ceremony, but the buffalo, the return of our buffalo to our people. And uh, Mr. Irvin Carlson, who's the president of ITBC, Intertribal Bison Council, uh, is a Blackfeet member, and he's here with us today. So, Irvin, can we have you come up and just talk a little bit for a couple minutes on the uh, uh, return of the buffalo? They just celebrated National uh, Mammal Day, which is the buffalo, and uh, proud and honored to have Irvin be part of that. The buffalo is an integral part of our Blackfoot culture. That's the, the teaching. It's the source of life. So we'll have Irvin say a few words here today. Thank you, Jim. Um, my name is Irvin Carlson. I'm a member of the Blackfeet Tribe in Montana. Um, I work uh, as the Buffalo Program Manager there, and also I'm the president of uh, an organization called the Intertribal Buffalo Council. And that organization is, I think we're at 70 tribes now across 19 states. And the mission of um, the Intertribal Buffalo Council 
is to bring uh, buffalo back to our lands, to our to tribal lands. And we've been in existence for 28 years now. You know, it was good for me to, to listen to all of our elders here uh, today in talking about our past and the things that we, we had lost. And a big part was our language and having to come out uh, or be in secret to do uh, our ceremonies. Those are a lot of things that, that we had lost and weren't allowed to do. And one of the big things that we lost, I guess, along with our culture, and it's my, my uh, I guess, passion in my life now to bring back the part of our culture and spirituality that we had lost and to near extinction was also um, the buffalo. And the buffalo were um, our existence. They were our economy. They were uh, our food, our clothing, our lodging and tools. And uh, they meant everything to us. And they're used in ceremonies. Um, those, in the, in the day that they were hunted to near extinction, um, a few were put into to the Yellowstone area. We fight that issue of trying to bring those animals out of there um, alive. And uh, I always relate to, to them there as to the way we were uh, put on reservations and weren't allowed to leave, um, weren't allowed to hunt anymore. Um, and actually didn't, our people were punished for speaking their language, you know, and, and a lot of us now at, at, at Blackfeet are, and me, myself, you know, are pitiful because um, losing the language and not, not having that language. I really, uh, I'm proud of Robert, how he is, uh, really took taking it upon himself to to learn our language and to be able to uh to talk that you know that's a big thing there too that um, i was raised by my grandparents who done nothing but talk our language but i guess it was that instilled in them that um to not to not bring that language out and so they didn't teach their their children to uh, carry that on and to talk the language but anyway, you know, with uh, being a part of the Buffalo and bringing them back, um, I know we're at the end of here, so I don't um, get into a lot of, but it was talked about yesterday and, and also with Earl on the first night that we're here and, and with the Buffalo. What I have seen through my years of being a part of that organization, being that at home, taking care of those, those Buffalo and bringing them back, I think in uh, 1974, they were brought back to our reservation. And uh, I think there was only about 75 animals. Today, we're um, right around 600 um, animals. And the other, the other um, in Canada, our people over there are part of uh, what we call the e, e initiative. And it's working together to, uh, to bring buffalo back to our lands. But, um, what I've seen throughout the years of, of what I was doing with um, the buffalo is um, even with the, the Blackfoot Confederacy. And um, when we started bringing buffalo back the way I've seen it, it brought our people back together too. And they started becoming stronger and um, in, in throughout my years, you know, there was a, there's a, a little story that maybe I, it might take a little time, but I want to tell where, where I realized what, what the buffalo, um, how strong they were in spiritual, spirituality and what they, they made things happen. But there were some animals years ago that were captured on Blackfeet and they were taken across the mountains uh, to the Salish and Kootenai country and sold there. They uh, were there, and when they had too many animals, they sent them, uh, tried to sell them to the U.S. government, and they didn't want them, so they sold them to the Canadian government. Those animals ended up in uh, the Elk Island National Park up by Edmonton, Alberta, and they were there for many years. So working with other partners that we had, we found out about these animals, these buffalo, and we, we were met with Elk Island, and we found out the origin of those animals 
that they ri originated on Blackfeet. And it was a big story um, about those, those buffalo, that they had made a big circle um, from our land to the Salish and Kootenai to, um, to Elk Island uh, um, National Park. And they had been there for many years. And then after we found out about that, we brought them back to the Blackfeet Reservation. And um, we went through a lot of, um, a lot of, um, I guess, um, media. There, it was a big story, so there was a lot of media, big stories. And we would, every time we went there and helped work in Buffalo, they would, uh, the people would be there interviewing. But one day after an interview, they asked me to get out into this, um, into this, pa this pen with these, these uh, buffalo calves. And I guess that's another part of the story is that I really wanted to bring those animals back to, to Blackfeet as adults and you know start the reproduction right away. But we have a fight with the state of Montana who didn't want us to bring buffalo back. And so we ended up with just calves that can come in without a vaccination um, as long as they were younger than 18 months. But anyway, you know, um, and then out later on during that time, uh, the state of Montana called me and said, well, Irvin, um, you can go ahead and bring adult animals in. Um, they're good to come in. They had a risk assessment. But it was already too late. Those animals were gone. So, uh, um, so then um, so as I got out into that, that, um, that place there and, and talked at Penn and, and, and just, they asked me just to go out there and they were going to film me just looking at them. So I did. And you know, it hit me there. And, and as we have our real spiritual leaders here, and, and I'm, you know, far from that, but I believe in our ways. I really believe in our ways, our, our traditional ways and our, and our prayers, our ways. But anyway, it hit me then that all of the years that I'd been doing these things with Buffalo, and I wanted those to come back as, uh, as adults so we could start that uh, reproduction right away. Then Buffalo made it happen the way they, they wanted it to happen. They left there as calves, and they wanted to come back there as calves. And it was a big story, they, and um, a lot of media on it. But they made, the way I seen it, it hit me there, is they made all of those things happen. And even all of the people that I had met on, on all of the journey that I had of, of uh, bringing back Buffalo, and the people that it brought together, and even um, with uh, um, the Blackfoot Confederacy, out of that, that bringing back Buffalo and, and, and starting the e, e project, we had, uh, I think I'm getting the sign to cut it off, but <laughs> talking too long, but he's been over there making this sign. And anyway, there's somebody back there saying it. But anyway, I think it's pretty important to know that, that with how, how them Buffalo are so strong in their, their spirituality that, that they, they made those things happen. And the way we wanted it to happen, it didn't. It was the way they wanted it to happen. And one other thing I wanted to say is that, and it talked about us still being here. I spoke one time, you know, at a, at a, at a here in Washington, D.C., and ITBC was, was getting an award. But anyway, in that, there was a lot of people there, and I thought maybe I would, would be saying the wrong thing, but I said, the buffalo were killed off in order to get rid of the Indians. But then Buffalo are still here, and the Sundians are still here, and we'll always be here. Thank you. Okay. My fellow men asked me, we'll close with the Petrified Buffalo Stone song. That goes with this, what Irvin is talking about. This was a story of our people when, when they were without the buffalo, the buffalo left, and they were starving. And this one lady, this lady went walking. He wasn't just.
petrified buffalo stuff. As the lady was walking, he heard, she heard a song. And she didn't know where it was coming from. But as she kept walking, she come up on this buffalo stone. This buffalo stone was the one that was singing. And in the words that buffalo stone gave, take me, I'm holy. Bring me to your people for their survival. This is the buffalo stone song. It's been, it comes from way back and we're still using the song. These men are still using that song within their bundles and the sacred gatherings that they have. So let us stand as we sing the Buffalo Stone. for joining us this afternoon. Don't forget to take part in our celebrations out in the Potomac area out here and the uh, dancing and the drumming and the um, artists that we have. And Join us in again tomorrow if you didn't make it today. Thank you.